Last week we talked about mind games. Last week we talked about mind games. If you were not able to be here last week, I encourage you to find the sermon on YouTube and take a look because all these sermons are building. All these sermons are building one on the other. And uh, somebody came up to me last week and they said, Pastor, we love the message. And, and, and they said, and I noticed for the most part, I only fight with my wife when we're on our way to church, Pastor. What is that? And I said, your remedy and how I can cure that is you all need to take two cars. Come on, somebody. You need to take two cars to church. Can I get a name? Don't amen. Don't amen. Don't amen. Don't amen. But, uh, but uh, you know, as soon as the kids are old enough, then take three cars. And then you ain't got nobody to fight with but yourself, praise the Lord. So, so I just want to encourage you. I want to talk to you about exposing the enemy. We're going to go to our, our text in 2 Corinthians. This is the text that we're going for. And then we're going to jump on into Genesis 3. Now, this translation right here, once again, is the NIV. But when we get to Genesis 3, I'm going to be reading out of the NLT. Very important to distinguish the difference. But it says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. For the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, in other words, the, the way you're going to fight the enemy is not the same way you would fight growing up. It's matter of fact, I'm going to take it a step further. It's not even the same way you would fight with your spouse or you would fight with your boss or you would fight with anybody. It's not a natural fight. It's a spiritual. It's a spiritual battle that can only be won if you are surrendered and on your knees. You cannot win these battles by yelling at a person. You cannot win these battles by fisticuffs with the person. You can only win these types of battle if you're wrestling with them in prayer. It's the only way it's won is through a spiritual means because he says, on the contrary, they have what? Power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds. It says this, we demolish these arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Very important that, you, that, that we see this. Against the knowledge of God, okay? And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ and we will be ready to punish every act of di disobedience once your obedience is complete. Jump on over to Genesis 3. It says this, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? I want you to notice the first thing the enemy will always attack is the prophetic promise and the prophetic word that God gives you. He will always attack that. He will always go for the sucker punch because what he's trying to do is get you to trust his words and not God's words. Now watch, I'll show you to you to unfold. She said, of course we may eat from any fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it is only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will what? Die. Check this out. He says, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll, you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to underline the part that says good and evil. This is very, very critical to what we're going to talk about tonight. This, this matter of fact, this might be the foundation for what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to unpack this here in just a moment. And he says this. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful. Now, now I have to pause because this is going to be a highlighted moment. This is a poor translation right here. If you go to the NASB or even King James, oh, excuse me, New King James, it doesn't say the tree was beautiful. It says that she saw the tree and the tree was good. Good. And I'm going to, this is, this is key, this is paramount. I'm going to unpack this part. I'm going to unpack this part as soon as we get to it. It says this, that the tree is beautiful and, the, and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight and to be with you. Lord, I just pray that I speak not as a man, but as an oracle of you, trusting in everything you're about to say tonight, Lord, believing that I'm an ambassador today, Father God. Holy Spirit, I yield my tongue. I yield my thoughts. I yield everything to the power, the presence, and the promise of your, uh, of your Holy Spirit tonight, Lord. I just rebuke the enemy who would even go now and try to sow lies. 
who would try to sow lies to, to God's people. And I just thank you, Lord, that the only voice we'll hear tonight is not even the voice of the preacher, but the voice of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. So I think it's interesting as we, as we look at parts of this text, I think it's interesting because the enemy, the Bible says, was crafty. He was crafty. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what to attack. And I find it, I find it just a little bit strange that the first place he would attack is a perfect person living in a perfect place, serving a perfect God. And the first place he goes to attack is for them to get more perfect than what they already are. Perfectionism will kill your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll say it over here, just in case. I don't want them to feel like I'm picking on them, okay? But perfectionism will kill your relationship with God because God never called you to be perfect. He said, once you accept Christ, you are perfect. What, your perfect position in him. Now, that's not saying there's not some things you don't need to work out. Yeah, your flesh needs to work some things out. But the spirit of Christ that lives inside of you is already perfected. So all you're doing is trying to work out those fleshly things. Come on. And so all of a sudden he attacks Eve by saying, did you know you could get more perfect? Did you know you could get smarter? Did you know you could get more knowledge? He starts by questioning what God has already spoken to her and her husband. And I just think it's interesting the way he, the way he sows this lie is to tell her there's something good you're missing out on. See, he didn't entice her with the evil part of the tree. You know, half the times you fall into sin, it's not with the evil part of the tree, it's with the good part of the tree. But the tree itself was off limits, the good and the evil. But we're attracted to the good part of the tree, not necessarily the evil part of the tree. And a lot of times when the enemy gets us to fall, he gets us to fall by looking at the good part of the tree, not the evil part of the tree. And you gotta, you gotta let this sink in. So he said to her, that you will be even more wise. You'll be just like God if you ate from this tree. That couldn't be further from the truth. He didn't say you would be all powerful. He didn't say you would conquer God. He didn't say you would rule the world. He knows she already had this power within her. She was already an administrator. She was already a human resource manager of the earth. He attacked the good part. In other words, there's something God is holding out from you. There's something God doesn't want you in on that you're not privy to. There's something you're missing out on. And this is the open door that we give the enemy. See, you're missing out on something. And so we bite to it because he points to this good. And so he sows lies of doubt and envy into our hearts, thinking, and here it is, thinking that your happiness is the highest goal to life. That your happiness is what everybody should cater to. Most of all, it's what God should give in to. Your happiness. Well, I got news for your happiness. Your happiness is fickle. I got three amens and the rest of you kind of give me some head nods. Think about this. Think about this. You were happy when you first got that car. Are you still happy? No, you were yelling at it. Just this afternoon, you was yelling at it. Kick the tire. Told your vehicle you don't love it no more. Your eyes breaking down. You were happy when you first got married. Oh, we won't go there. So I'm going to back out real quick, John. Did you see that? I went and I put it in reverse real quick. Come on. Yeah. But we, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about the marriage. But here's my point. You're always happy when you first get something. But it's not about our happiness. It's not about our happiness. You know, God's first priority for you is not happiness. It's holiness. It's holiness. And I, and I think we lose sight of this, but he attacks this. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you this quote. I put this. The only authority the devil has is what you allow him to have by agreeing with the lies he has deposited in your heart. The only authority he has is what you agree with that comes out of his mouth. That's it. Past that, at any given time, you can rebuke the enemy. At any given time, you can resist the enemy. At any given time, you can take authority 
over the demonic presence that plagues your soul. You, you are in charge. But the second we come into agreement with the lie of the enemy, he takes ownership of that thought, and you can no longer take it captive until you get the truth of God's word to shine the light. Because, see, by confessing it, you come into agreement. By confessing it, you, you literally are married to it now. You are in a, a covenant agreement with it. Oh, you see that? I, I, I was just born this way. No, you weren't. You were born as an image bearer of God. And when you get born again, you are born again into a family. You are born again into where Christ is your brother as well as redeemer. But upon that confession, you begin to marry yourself. Well, see, you don't understand, Pastor. I just have anger. No, you don't understand. You can get delivered. You can get free. You ain't got to stay bound. Well, you don't understand. I always just lie a little bit. No, you don't understand. You can tell the truth a little bit. Right? But this is what we say. And some of us, we need to see the truth and what is happening. Because here's the deal. The devil always sows lies and he comes in and, 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 and he says stuff like this. He says stuff like this. See, God's healing is for everybody else. It's just not for you. See, God's prosperity is for everybody else. It's just not for you. See, if God was really there for you, he wouldn't let people pick on you. He wouldn't let people mistrust or mistreat you. See, what he does is he will sow these lies and he's just going to keep sowing and so one of them sticks. And so one of them sticks, and then all of a sudden, he's going to set the hook. And it's when he sets the hook that we, gets ourse- that we get ourselves into trouble. So here's what I'm going to do. I felt like in order to truly expose the enemy, I just want to give you some key points that I know the enemy is guilty of. And so we're just going to go through a few things, and uh, you just write down whatever comes to you. The first one is this. I want you to notice that the devil always lies. Matter of fact, I'm going to take this step further, and, and this might... This might wreck some of your guys' theology, but I know this to be the gospel truth. The devil is incapable of even telling the truth. Listen to me. The way God cannot tell a lie is the way Satan cannot tell the truth. You got you to catch this. You got to catch this. The way God cannot tell a lie. Did you know God cannot lie? Even if you think it was going to be a lie, like, you know, like, uh, like if I was to say, like, my hair is red. If God was to say my hair is red, what do you think would happen? My hair would change colors and it would be red. You could call me Canelo from here on out, right? That just means redhead in Spanish. That's all it means. Literally means cinnamon. But that's, if, 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 if God was to say, you know, Anthony is white, I'd just, bam, Michael Jackson me, man. I'd bleach my skin. It would happen. That's funny. <laughs> that just came to me on the spot, too. But my point is, God, even, even if you think God was getting ready to tell a lie, the second he started to speak it, it would become truth. The exact opposite is true with the enemy. He is incapable of telling the truth. I'll prove it to you. Look at this verse. It says, and this is in John 8, 44. He says, for you are the children of your father. He's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. You are the children of your father, the devil. Why would he say that? What is he saying that for? And you love to do evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated what? He don't... It's not that he can't even tell the truth. He hates the truth. Do you know who the truth is? Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Check this out. Because there is what? No truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character. That's all he can do. So when he starts to lie to you, here it is, the exact opposite of what he's telling you is what? The truth. When he says, hey, God has forgotten you, that means God is remembering you. God is with you. But what he's hoping you will do is he's hoping you will confess it. He'll go, and he'll come to you. God has forgotten you. God has forgotten you. God has forgotten you. Now all of a sudden, you're going to wake up one day. Man, I think God has forgotten me. Got you. Got you. Why? Because the truth is he knows God is fighting for you. God is with you. God loves you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But he's waiting for you to come into agreement with what he's planting into your heart. It says this, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The father of lies. Second, he attacks from the last point of victory. He attacks from the last point of victory. Now, we're going to get very candid in here. We're going to get very candid in here, okay? 
So now listen, I'm going to be very direct. So you're going to kind of feel like you got called to the principal's office, but I promise you it's with nothing but love for you in my heart, okay? It's nothing but love, all right? Nothing but love. But here's the deal. Whatever you fail to last is where the devil will pick up to attack you again first. Can I, can I go there? So in other words, if you lied and cheated on your taxes and it was your financial realm, it's the, the next part, the next attack coming from the enemy is going to be back with your financials again. If you were clicking on the internet and you turned on to something that you weren't supposed to be at and that you weren't supposed to do, it'll be the next thought that comes into your head even after you repent. It's the next place the enemy will fight you with. He will always pick up from the last place he got victory from you over. He won't pick up something else. He won't say, hey, you know, the last thing you did was steal, so I'm going to hit you at a point where maybe that, you know, you'll just have anger. No, he's going to go right back to stealing again. He always picks up from the last point of victory. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. And, and I'm going to go sports analogy on you real quick, okay? If you're on a sports team and the last play just got you a touchdown, you keep running that play until they stop you. So what do you think he's going to do? What he's going to do is he's just going to fight you from the last place he already got you. Why? Because it works. Because it works. Because it works. If he knows all he's got to do is get that family member to send you a text message and you'll go all, uh, you know, you'll go into the house being a hot mess and yelling at the kids and your spouse and everything else. He's going to have that person text you every other day. Oh, I know that part was good. Because I heard that, I heard that kind of like ouch laugh. <laughs> <laughs> right? He only, he only attacks from the last point of victory. He only attacks from the last point of victory. So check this out. So what he's going to do is he's going to set you up. If you're over here thinking, well, I don't know if I can trust this person I'm with, oh, he's going to hit you every day because you done confess what the game plan is going to be. He's going to hit you every way. He gonna, he, 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 your, your husband's going to come home late one time. Could have been stuck in traffic, but you're going to be questioning Mm-hmm. Where were you? She call you? Who is she? I don't know who she is. Can you at least give me a name? Mm-hmm. I saw you had eyes. What eyes? My gosh, I'm half blind to begin with. What you talking about? You, you see where I'm going with this? He will only attack from the last point of victory. But we got to be wise to what is going down. Let's go, let's, go to, let's go to another one. He picks off the isolated. He picks off the isolated. I want you to notice that in Matthew 4, 2, it says that after Jesus was alone, after Jesus was alone, the enemy came to him to tempt him. You ever notice, you ever notice with those hidden battles, those hidden battles you have, whatever, whatever those hidden sins are that you have, you ever notice it's a lot easier to do it when you're alone than when you are with people? Did you ever notice that? It's when you're alone, the devil starts bringing everything back to mind. Why? Because he knows that if he gets you alone, you're easier to move than if you got people linked up arm in arm with you. If you got people praying with you. If you got other believers who are around you. He knows that. So he specifically gets you to isolate yourself. And the number one way he does this is so you getting offended. See, I knew I couldn't trust Christians. Well, can they trust you? You called yourself a Christian. See, what we always do is we, we hold other people to a higher expectation than what we hold ourselves to. And we always put that on other people. Sitting there over here going, well, can I trust other people? Can they trust you? Again, there was that awkward laugh. <laughs> and then you're over here going, I knew I should have came tonight. This is the word you needed to hear. So what happens? You cannot, you cannot isolate yourself. And I meet people all the time who try to tell me, well, you know, I can just have church all by myself in my house. No, that's how you end up weird. Why are we laughing? That, that was, in my notes, it does not say ha, ha, ha. You know why? We need people to help keep us in check. We need people to come up to us and go like, Yo, man, the way you broke that verse down a little bit, I, I, I think you need a little adjustment there. I think you're on to something, but we need to talk it through. Think about that. Okay, so let's go to another point. Let's go to another point. I got, I got a few more. I got, how about this one? He doesn't fight fair. You, you, you know, um, <laughs> I'm going to go old school with some movies. Is that okay? 
Like, God speaks to me through movies sometimes. Anybody remember the movie The Untouchables? Anybody remember that Kevin Costner? Is it? Anybody a fan? I love that movie. Sometimes when I'm feeling down and out, I just got to watch The Untouchables. You know, because Sean Connery, although my wife still got like a crush on Sean Connery, you know what I mean? It, it's okay, though. I understand it's that Irish accent. You know, I, I get it. I, I love you, babe. It's all right. I look nothing Irish, but it's okay. And so I watched this movie, and I love, I love when they're in the actual church, and, and, and he looks at Kevin Costner and he goes, you want to get Capone? Do you want to get Capone? I don't know how to do an Irish accent. And so anyway, it was kind of British, but it wasn't Irish. And so he goes, yeah. And this is what he says. He says, then don't fight fair. He said, if he beats up one of your guys, you stab one of his. He says, never bring a knife to a gunfight. And if he wounds one of yours, kill three of his. You are not fighting a fair battle. The enemy will never fight fair. Can I tell you where the enemy will attack first? He will go to your mind, and then he'll go to what you love. And he always knows what you love. All, trust me, if he can't get you to buy into the lie in your mind, he'll go after your baby. Whoever your favorite is in your house, we'll figure out real quick, because they're the one getting attacked. He knows. He knows what's going on. He knows who the, what, the uh, Nino de Oro, right? The golden child is, right? He knows when you come home. No, I'm serious. Because he doesn't fight fair. He fights to win. He fights to win. And so he attacks the things that we hold on to. Now, now check this out. Now check this out. When we get offended and when we pull away is when he piles on. And if you think about these things that he doesn't fight fair, he times things perfectly. Yeah, you, you, you don't think it's coincidence? You don't think it's coincidence that maybe you was fighting, you know, with your significant other, and then all of a sudden you show up at work, and, and, and these people want to talk to you? They got some eyes for you? You don't think that's coincidence? You, you, you just think you're that good looking that this is all going to happen at the same time? I think that came out a lot worse than, than what I was meaning to say. But, well, well, I don't know what to say. My whole point is, you don't think the enemy's setting that up? You don't think the enemy's setting that up? He's he fighting dirty. You don't think he knows when your spouse is out of town? You don't think he's going to come at you sideways, try to plant a little something, try to throw a little something your way? A a almost every day when they show up especially, I work out at the gym with a few brothers. I, I prefer to do that. Why? It's good accountability. Plus, there's other people to pick on, you know, and, and it's just fun. And just the other day, my wife was in Texas. And I was waiting for the Usos to show up, and they left me hanging. But it's okay. I won't point them out. I'm talking about Mana and Ben right here. And so, and so I'm there, and I'm by myself, and, 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 and I'm working out. And so remember, I usually have my boys with me. And we usually know other people there who we stop to talk with. And, you know, we just have a good community. And, and, and just this day, I, I don't know, it was whatever, Tuesday, Wednesday, I don't know. And, and I remember just this day. And plus, trust me, if you go what time we go in the morning, you pretty much know everybody who shows up. Because new people just don't come at 5.30 in the morning to go to the gym. It's just, that's not when new people show up, okay? And so just this day, this, this woman comes in, and I, I'm over here minding my business, and they know me. When they ain't around, I got the earphones in, and I'm gone, man. I got to get the work in, plus I got to get home and take the kids to school. And this girl wanted to get half naked right where I was working out. I mean, like, everything's just coming out. And, and, and so I did what you should do. I felt that spirit because all these guys came around me to work out next to me. And I'm like, y'all weren't even here five minutes ago. So I did what you would do. I just started praying in tongues. Yes, I did. Started praying in tongues. And then I took it a step up. I rebuked the devil right now in Jesus' name, coming over here with lust. In Jesus' name, I plead the blood. Everybody just starts, psh, gone, gone, gone. Say, that's right. Take authority over here. I ain't got time for this. Notice, notice she didn't leave because she had her headphones in. So I did what you would do. I said, you won't leave, I'll leave. Because I ain't got no time for this. See why? Because the enemy knows what to do. He is the only person who could get a king to stay home and get a naked woman to take a bath right next to him. Let that sink in. Should I say that one more time? He's the only person that could get a king to stay home named David. The Bible says in 2 Samuel that he should have went off the war. He stayed home. Went up to his rooftop at the right hour to see Bathsheba taking a bath butt naked? Come on, somebody. Only the devil could set that up. That's why I said, don't think when you go to work, all of a sudden you got better looking. No, the devil's got your number. 
<sighs> Next here, he doesn't show compassion. The devil will pile on you. He doesn't show compassion. He's incapable of it. He will not do it. Number one, uh, next one, he hates you. Get this through to your head. He hates you. There's no love in this guy. Why? Because he cannot be redeemed. He wonders why you get to mess up all day, every day, and still ask for forgiveness, and he messed up one time and he's done. You took his place as the worshiper. That was his job. He hates you. Last but not least, he is crafty. He is crafty. 2 Samuel 11, I already quoted it to you. He had David go up on the top of a building when he should have been at war. So here's the, here's the, here's the thing that I want to talk to you about. The victory position. You have to resist the devil. I want you to notice this verse, and I left it up here just so we can all just look at it together. Because in here is the blueprint for victory. Watch this. He says, and I quote, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you're not careful and you just read that, everybody always thinks the prideful person is sitting next to them. You ever been in church and been like, man, so-and-so should have been here to hear this message. <laughs> oh, I got somebody on that one, huh? You ever thought that? Man, my husband should have been here. No, nope. you needed to be here. This for you, you know. I love how Timothy Keller says that he goes, uh, you ever notice that, um, you know, those people who look down on people? Oh, yeah, we hate those people who look down on people. And so he said, well, do you look down on people who look down on people? Why you got to always be right, Timothy? Why you got to always be right? And that's the subtlety of pride. It's not one sin amongst many. It's the root of all sin. So when you think, oh, I could beat the enemy on my own, that's pride. Or I'm not worried about getting tempted. I'm stronger than that. That's pride. God opposes every prideful thought you have. You are fighting God with every prideful thought you have. I'm not going to apologize. They need to apologize. Hello, pride. I'm not going to go say hi to them if they don't say hi to me. Hello, pride. How's that working for you? And the second you open the door with pride, the enemy welcomes himself. Because watch, here's the remedy. Watch, here's the remedy. I'm not making this with the Bible. He says, humble yourself before God. I noticed it didn't say, humble your kids. Humble your neighbor. Humble your spouse, since we're going there. It didn't even say, humble your, you know, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law. It says, you Humble yourself. You can only control you. Check this out. Notice this. Before God. And look what you'll have the power to do. This is how it reads in the text and the manuscripts, right, before we translate it. When you humble yourself before God, you will have the power to resist the devil because you shut the door. And what does it say he will do when you resist the devil? He will what? He will stick around? He going to hang out? He going to camp. He going he going to build a campground in your head, huh? No, he will flee from you. So I wanted to give you this illustration growing up as a kid, uh, growing up as a kid, uh, when they were trying to teach me how to fish, uh, two things they always taught me. Number one is when the fish starts to bite, learn how to set the hook. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Set the hook, right? When that fish starts to nibble a little bit. My, my, my mom used to tell me, Mijo, you're always so strong. You know, you always want to yank the, 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 the hook out of the fish's mouth so you pull too hard. She goes, when you set the hook and you, and, and you grab the pole, you got to come back and you got to go, whoa. Just like that. Go ahead. Go ahead with me on three. One, two, three. Whoa. Everybody, come on. Ready? One, two, three. Whoa. You got to set that hook. So she taught me. She, if you set the hook, you get it real set in their mouth. And then when they try to swim away, they only dig that hook deeper into the mouth, right? And so here was the second thing. The second thing she would always tell me is, you got to know what bait to use. You got to know what bait to use. Yeah, the bait. It's funny, if you ever go fishing with people and you see a dude who's got a lot of fish, or if you see a you know, group of people who got a lot of fish, what's the first question you ask? You ready? Hey, what you using? And the fishermen will never tell you the truth. They will always lie to you. Oh, man, we're using some power bait. 
You liar using crickets. I saw the cricket jump out the boat. Right? Come on. So it's the, it's the, it's the set the hook and it's the bait. And I got to thinking about that. Outside of God, I know somebody who knows you better than you know you. It's the devil. He's had somebody studying you your whole life. You know that person who broke your heart? He sent them. You know that person who stole your bike? Sent them. You got to catch this. He's been prepping you your whole life so that he can set the final hook to keep you away from Jesus Christ. So you know what he did? He went bait shopping, and he went after this little shiny bait called a spinner. It's to distract you. It's to get you looking. It's to agitate you so you will bite. But what you didn't see on the back of it was the word called lust. He said, I'm going to have you set up to where you find your old man's stash of pornography when you were seven. And you were so attracted by what you saw, I set the hook of lust in your heart. And now you have a hard time even looking at women without having bad thoughts. He got you lusting. Why? Because he wants to set the hook. See, the devil don't fight fair, so he's not looking to set the hook for, for just you. He wants your kids and your kids' kids. He wants it for generations. So all of a sudden he said, no, pastor, that's not really, that's not really my problem. So what's he do? He gets you with good old power bait. He gets his power bait working. He says, man, I'm going to get this. But what you don't realize is that we all have an open door because we all deal with pride. You know, he set it up when you were younger and your dad walked out. So now you have a hard time just trusting men in general. And now you said to yourself, since my dad couldn't take care of me, then I'm the only one who's going to take care of me. So every time God starts to look out for you and tries to take care of you, you resist because of your pride. Your pride. He's trying to set this hook. He's trying to get you to bite. Okay, so maybe pride ain't your problem, right? Because you're the most humble person you know. So what he does is he comes to you, and he comes to you with a different type of bait, but this bait is a little different because he tries to get you to focus in on the pain you felt. It's not salmon eggs, it's pain. It's the pain. And then the enemy comes over and whispers into your ear, and he says, you know what? God don't love me, because if he did, he'd realize I'm in a lot of pain. So he's setting the hook. Last but not least, and trust me, there's more. He, gets, he brings out the big guns. He brings out worms. You know how hard it was to find worms in Fresno? I went to Walmart for you. I had to get an amen right there. These ain't worms. This is envy and jealousy. You're envious. You see other people on fire for God, and you go, why not me? You see other people getting their prayers heard, and you go, God, why can't you answer mine? Matter of fact, you know what gets you? Because it's the same thing that gets me. You see people who ain't even living right getting blessed, and so you start to question God. God, they ain't even living right, and they're getting all the blessings. And you become envious, which in turn makes you jealous. Why they get a new car? You know they don't know how to handle money. And so out of your mouth comes words of judgment. They'll blow it just like they blow everything else. Man, who would want friends like that? Is he setting the hook tonight? Has he got you looking at the bait? I know this all too well. I know this all too well. But I'm going to give you the key to victory. You got to fight. You got to resist the enemy. You've got to resist the enemy. Why? Because here's what he will not tell you that I'm going to tell you tonight as we close. He hears the conversations you don't hear. And what I mean by that is he could hear your name with your bosses talking about your promotion. He can hear that. And so what he does is he says, I've got to do everything I can 
to make sure they self-sabotage so they will not get that promotion. So he goes in and he starts whispering into your ears. He starts to get you with envy and jealousy and pride. He does anything he can so that you will open up your mouth and you will sabotage your own promotion. See, what he's doing is, is he's getting you to look over there because he knows your answer is coming from over here. But if he can distract you with the shiny things, with the other baits, if he can keep your focus over here, your focus will never be on Jesus. And you will lose every time because it's when Peter looked at the water is when he fell. It's when he took his eyes off Jesus. So he's got the spinner bait. He's got the power bait. He's got everything going on over here. See, God doesn't hear you. You see, you did all this for Jesus and still your kid ended up sick. See, you did all this for Jesus and still your kid ended up hurt. You did all this for Jesus and your marriage still isn't working out. And it gets you looking over here with Jesus with the still small voice says, keep your eyes right here. Focus. Focus, focus, focus. Tonight, it's time to take the hook out of our mouth. Why? Because our redemption is coming. It's time to take the hook out of our mouth. Why? Because our miracle is in the house. But we, can't, we do not have room for both the hook and the presence of God in our mouth. you got to spit one out and bite on the other tonight. Because this is exposing the enemy. We have the victory tonight. In Jesus' name, this is what we must do. We have to do it. God wants to so radically change your life, but you got to get rid of, you got to get rid of these things. So tonight, tonight you got to resist the enemy. Tonight you got to renounce the things that have put a hook in your heart. Tonight is how we fight from a place of victory because Jesus has already given it given us this victory but it starts with our worship it starts with our praise it starts with us crying out to him that he's got this reckless love for us church it starts here I I, I, I remember I remember this church this pastor telling me one this one time he says he says until we get victory you got to fight and I think in Spanish is hasta la victoria siempre. We need to fight until then, so victory is always in our grips, in our grasping. This is what we need to do, church. I'm tired. I'm tired of biting. I'm tired of getting a hook in my mouth. I'm tired of it. I don't want victory just for me. I want it for my household, Rick. I want it for my kids. I don't want my kids to struggle with what I struggled with. I want to be where it stops. Divorce stops in this family. Do you see what I'm saying? Alcoholism stops in this family. Drug addiction with this family. It all starts here. The lust of power, the lust of women, the lust of greed. It all stops with me right here, right now. Why? Because I want the presence of God flowing out of this mouth. Not anything else. It starts here. We got to fight, church. It's not going to be easy. We got to fight. Father, we come before you. In just this moment of just you and us. We come in this moment of, of acknowledging that we're prideful. We're prideful, Jesus. We trust in ourselves way too much. And we underestimate the Holy Spirit way too much. Jesus, forgive us of our pride. Forgive us of our envy and our jealousy. Jesus, we can't do this unless you help us.